Cindy, why don't you already start um, explaining the muting and muting and all that, and then we are almost ready to go. Absolutely. So as we wait for those people to join us, um, we are going to have a, a fairly robust crowd today. So I'd like to ask everyone to make sure that you are muted and that you stay muted. If you don't mind, go ahead and stop sharing your video as well. That will help to maximize the feed so that everyone um, gets the absolute best picture of Professor Bauer. As well as if you have any questions, make sure that you uh, put them in the chat, either as you think of them or there at the end, and we'll get to as many as we can. If you're not familiar with where to find the chat, just kind of wiggle your mouse across and you'll see a little lasso at the bottom of your screen. You click on that and then there's your chat button. All right, I think with that, then we should uh, begin. Um, let me just quickly introduce myself. I'm uh, Mirz Roma, I'm the director of the Ackerman Center, and it's now my great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Professor Patterson, who then will make the proper introduction of our distinguished speaker today. David. Yes, thank you, Niels. Uh, my thanks to um, my esteemed colleagues at the Ackerman Center, now the home for the Annual Scholars Conference on the Holocaust, uh, Debbie Fister, Sarah Valente, Pedro Gonzalez, uh, Cindy Seaton Rogers, without whom none of this could happen. Um, the, the Annual Scholars Conference on the Holocaust in the Churches is the longest running conference on the Holocaust of its kind. The first meeting was in 1970 and uh, many look to that occasion as the, the foundation of Holocaust studies as an academic discipline unto itself. Um, Franklin Littell and Hubert Locke, both of loving blessed memory, were the founders of that conference. We are blessed and fortunate to have Marcy Littell on with us, um, who uh, uh, a, a trailblazing scholar in her own right in Holocaust education. She's the founder of the Holocaust master's program at Stockton, now Stockton University. So uh, this, every major scholar has passed through this conference over the years. Um, I've been involved with, in the conference for, for more than 30 years myself. And in the course of that time, uh, I've had the great blessing of meeting the, the, the most prominent scholars in the world, uh, introducing my students to them. And among those foundational historians of the Holocaust is Yehuda Bauer. Professor Bauer is the winner of the Israel Prize, the highest award given in Israel for, for, uh, for in his case, for history and scholarship. Professor Bauer was at the first Scholars Conference in 1970, so it's extraordinary and wonderful to have him with us. Uh, he is the author of, of uh, must be more than 50 books in, in, uh, on the Holocaust. Uh, I've, I've been using his books since about, since I started teaching the Holocaust in the mid eighties. Um, and I've seen Professor Bauer on many occasions. Uh, he's a wonderful speaker. He, he is the scholar, the historian who sets the standard, who has set the standard for the rest of us who study this, this very important subject. And today he will speak about the denial and distortion of Holocaust memory, which is precisely what is entrusted to the historians. The historians here are not, don't just report, they bear witness. They've been entrusted with this memory. So, Please, without further ado, Professor Bauer, let's all welcome Professor Yehuda Bauer. Please go ahead, Yehuda. Okay. Uh, just a moment, I lost you. We can see you, you're good, go ahead. We can see and hear you very well. Can you see me? Uh, yes. Can you see me? Yes, we can yes. see you and hear you. 
And you can hear me, okay. Yes. Uh, the uh, issue of denial and distortion is at the center of our worries today as we face uh, the 80th birth, the 80th uh, year after the, uh, uh, after the Holocaust. Now there's a difference between denial and distortion. Denial means that you deny the fact that the Holocaust happened, that you don't believe in the existence of the gas chambers, that you don't believe that the Germans, the German Nazis wanted to eliminate, annihilate the Jewish people, that uh, anti-Semitism was a crucial element in the Nazi policies. All that is the denial of the Holocaust. Now the denial of the Holocaust started actually on the left wing. In America, uh, Harry Elba Barbs, an American historian who opposed the entry of uh, the United States into World War I and thought that uh, the Americans should have kept out of the European conflict and then opposed the policy of Roosevelt to uh, intervene in one way or another into what was happening in Europe in the 1930s and then opposed the entry of the United States into World War II. And uh, when the war ended, and he was no friend of the Jews to start with, he began to doubt the stories about the existence of gas chambers and the program of the German Nazis to annihilate the Jewish people. And uh, this was a kind of a liberal uh, attack on the memory of the Holocaust. But of course, after him, you have a development of right-wing uh, denial of the Holocaust in the United States. And it gained ground. In Europe, this was something that started with two French socialists, uh, Maurice Bardesch, and mainly uh, Paul Racine. Paul Racine was a socialist deputy to the French parliament who uh, opposed war in principle as an opponent of war as such. And therefore the entry of France into a conflict with Germany. But when the a conflict happened and the Germans occupied France, he became part of the socialist French resistance, not the armed one. He helped, amongst other things, some Jews to escape from eastern France, from Alsace-Lorraine to the French border. He was arrested by the Germans because of his action within the French underground. He was brought to the concentration camps of Buchenwald and Dora, but was treated reasonably well by the uh, Germans who saw in him a, uh, an opponent, a, uh, no, not a very important opponent to their policies. And uh, when the war ended and he was liberated, he uh, doubted the stories about the gas chambers, about the annihilation of the Jews. He did not like the German policies in the, in the concentration camps. But he didn't think that that meant that you agreed with the stories about the annihilation of the Jewish people. And so he became the father of the European non-German denial of the Holocaust. And then again, this was carried over to the right-wing extremists, especially an individual by the name of Faurisson, who was a French professor of uh, literature at the University of Lyon and who uh, denied the Holocaust and thought that the Jews invented it in order to gain money from the Germans. 
uh, now the German survivors, the Nazis, denied the Holocaust while it was happening. And the stories are many of German uh, SS people telling the Jews in the concentration camps that even if you survive, nobody will believe you. Nobody will believe the stories that you're telling. And that was basically the line uh, that was followed by the Nazi survivors of the Holocaust. They did not deny that Jews had suffered during the war, but they said that this was vastly exaggerated by the Jews who had invented what we call the Holocaust, the mass annihilation of the Jewish people by the German Nazis, in order, again, to gain money, the usual anti-Semitic accusation against the Jews that all they want is money, and uh, the uh, base for the denial by ex-Nazis after the war, by American and French and other deniers, was the support of the Nazi regime, the, the, the opposition to the democratic governments that arose after the war. And even the non-democratic governments who recognized that the, war, that the Holocaust had happened. And the idea was that if you want to support the Nazi regime against the democracies, you have to deny that the Nazis committed a terrible crime. If you, de if you deny that they, didn't, that they committed a terrible crime, you then can say that the Nazi regime was a good one. And that the Allies, instead of uh, joining the Soviet Union and attacking Nazi Germany, they should have joined Nazi Germany in attacking the Soviet Union. That, was, that is the basis of the denial of the Holocaust. Now, this spread in what we call the West. The West is a very non-geographic definition. It comprises most of Europe and the Americas, parts of South America, parts of Central America, North America. Uh, Australasia, Austria, Australia, New Zealand, Japan. That's what is called the West, not very exact geographically. The uh, denial grew because it was needed for certain politicians who wanted to say that, as I said, that, that the Allies should have joined the Nazis in the attack of the Soviet Union. So you have a political issue there, which used the denial of the Holocaust to fortify a political position. The uh, denial received a terrible blow in the trial that was held in London in 1999 and 2000. Uh, the denier, the main denier of the Holocaust in Britain, David Irving, accused an American a uh, historian whom you know very well, Deborah Lipstadt of Emory University, who wrote in a book denying the Holocaust in which she said that David Irving was an anti-Semite who was denying the Holocaust and that he was a liar. And so David Irving uh, brought a, uh, a, a trial against her. Now, the lawyers that represented Deborah Lipstead did not put her on the witness stand. They did not present any witness testimonies. Instead, they brought some of the major historians that dealt with World War II and the Holocaust, uh, who were not Jewish. As actually, they, uh, David Irving did not find out that one of the major figures in the trial, uh, uh, Van Pelt had a Jewish mother, but that was something that was <laughs> not well known. 
and all the others were non-Jews. And uh, what happened was that the uh, judge at the end of the trial, Lord Gray, said that uh, David Irving was not a historian, but a liar, that he was an anti-Semite, that the Holocaust was a proven fact, and that uh, uh, and, and, and made a judgment, very clear judgment against not just David Irving, but against Holocaust denial as such. And that actually uh, it was a something of a death blow to major Holocaust denial in what I call the West. Now, this doesn't mean to say that it has disappeared. Here and there you still find it. And it's still dangerous. Still dangerous. It is still based on the same basis. The identification with the Nazi regime, the opposition to democracies, to liberalism, and the statement that the Jews invented the Holocaust. So it exists, but it's in the West, it's a minor thing. It does exist. And because you people live in the United States, there is a website called internetarchive.org in which you can find a huge amount of white supremacist, racist, and anti-Semitic anti websites that uh, will bring you the denial of the Holocaust in the United States as it is today. So it is still there, but it's not a major concern. It is a concern, not a very major one. Distortion is something quite different. To distort the Holocaust does not mean that you deny it. The distorters of the Holocaust say, yes, the Holocaust happened and it was terrible. But it's not we, whoever the we is, who did it. It's the Germans who did it. We, whoever the we is, had nothing to do with it. We did not do it. The major case today of the distortion of the Holocaust is by the the nationalistic, nationalistic, religiously fanatic Polish government, which was elected in 2015 in three elections. The PIS, let's see, the acronym of the Polish name of the party, this is Empire. And the party uh, said, yes, you know, we love Jews. We certainly don't deny the Holocaust. Ani Bezum. Uh, the denial, the uh, distortion of the Holocaust happens when you say that our. Ani Bezum leachol gaber. When you say that the. Uh, uh, Jews are wonderful people, especially the dead Jews. The dead Jews are marvelous. And we, the distorters of the Holocaust, create museums for them and have days of remembrance and make the most terrific speeches about them. But it's not we who had nothing to do with it. We tried to save the Jews. The Jews didn't always collaborate with us. The Jews who deliver, were delivered to the trains that led them to the, to, the, to the extermination camps were put on the trains by the Jewish police, by the Jewish councils, and the Polish people, in their vast majority, wanted to save Jews. And then you have a large number of real cases, quite correct cases, true cases of not just the right use who were recognized by Yad Vashem, slightly over 7,000, but uh, the many, many more whose names we will never know because they did not survive the Holocaust and the people whom they rescued did not survive the Holocaust. So you have a, uh, 
a uh, partial truth in this. Distortion means partial truth. It's not a complete lie. And this is terribly dangerous because what happened in Poland was according to Polish documentation, not Jewish documentation, not Israeli documentation, but a documentation by Polish liberal historians who tell us the truth. That yes, they were Polish rescuers, thousands of them, but they were a tiny minority. There were 21 million ethnic Poles in Poland at the time. And the maximum number of rescuers, even if you treble the number that was recognized by Yad Vashem, are less than 1% of the Polish population, according to Polish documentation. The vast majority of the Polish people were either opponents of Jews or indif indifferent in a hostile way to the Jews. And there's an argument amongst the Polish liberal historians what the probable number, probable number of Jews who were delivered by the post of the Nazis or who were killed by the post themselves. And the figure that was proposed by one of the major historians of this, Professor Jan Gabowski, who uh, teaches in, uh, in Ottawa and in Warsaw with a double nationality and supported by some of the liberal historians and others say it's either less or perhaps even more, 200,000 Jews were either delivered to the Polish police that collaborated with the Germans. The story that no Poles collaborated with the German is simply a lie. For 18,000 Polish police, the so-called blue police, who handed over Jews to the Germans or killed them themselves. There were fire brigades in every village because most of the buildings were built of wood. And the fire brigades collaborated with the Germans out of fear. This is not something that cannot be explained historically. Yes, the Poles were persecuted. The Poles were hunted too by the Germans, but they were hunted in a different way. There was no massive annihilation of the Poles because they were Poles. There were millions of Poles who were transported to Germany for forced labor, and many of them died as a result of forced labor. There were over 70,000 Poles who died in Auschwitz because they opposed the German government, yes? But the Germans had no program to annihilate the Polish people. The Germans had a program to annihilate the Jewish people. All of them, all the Jews. And so the Polish police handed over the Jews to the Germans or killed them themselves. The fire brigades and the heads of villages, heads of townships who collaborated with the Germans. Many of them were forced to do so. Many of them did so because they wanted to advance their careers. This is not the situation of the Jewish council. The Jewish council did not join the Jewish council, made them up because they wanted to advance their careers, but because they were forced to do so. And so you see the distortion is a crucial element today in the politics, in the current politics, not only in Poland, but in quite a number of other places as well. It's not we, it's only they. Now this completely ignores the fact that without the collaboration of smaller or larger elements of the populations that were ruled by the Germans or collaborated with them, the Holocaust would not have happened. The Germans could not have done it alone. It was directed by Germans, yes. It was planned by Germans, yes. 
it was executed to a large extent by Germans, yes. But without the collaboration of the local populations, it could not have been done. Even in countries that opposed Germany and rescued its Jews, like Denmark, for instance. Now you all know that the Danish population in the areas where Jews were living, a small Jewish community of over 7,000 people in Denmark, did everything in their power to rescue the Jews, Danish Jews, and ship them to Sweden that agreed to accept them. But there was a Danish Nazi party that collaborated with the Germans. They were more dangerous in the eyes of the, of the Danish resistance than the Germans themselves because the Dan Nazi Danes knew where the Jews lived. They knew their opponents in the Danish resistance. And you know, there were 6,000 Danish citizens who joined the Waffen SS, who joined the SS. They didn't kill Jews because by the time they, need, they reached the Eastern Front, there were no Jews there anymore. But they joined the SS. Now, when you write about that in Denmark, you have, there's no problem. There's a freedom of expression, the freedom of research. You can write about it. Nobody raises an eyebrow because of it. Nobody raises an eyebrow in Israel. When Yad Vashem studies, the major publication of Yad Vashem in this area, published two articles about Jewish collaboration with the Germans in Poland during the war. There were groups of Jews who collaborated with the Germans. One in Krakow, one in Warsaw. And there were articles written in the other Shem studies. Nobody objected for the, to the publication. Nobody said, you are sullying the name of the Jewish people. No, these are individuals for one reason or another collaborated with the Germans. Now, in Poland, if you write about Polish collaboration in the destruction of the Jews by elements in the Polish society, you are accused of dirtying the name of the Polish people, great Polish people. Now, I guess who is this done? Who is the enemy there? Not so much the Jews, you know. The Jewish population in Poland today is a tiny, tiny minority of some 15, 20,000 people. No, it's against the Polish liberals, the ones who tell us the truth. It's an internal struggle for the soul of the Jewish, of the Polish people, because there's a Polish tradition of liberalism, of humanism, of tremendous advances in human understanding. Some of the great, really great literary heroes of Europe are Poles. Some of the greatest poets, including a Nobel Prize winner a few years ago, Szymkowska, Nobel laureate, rightly so, has a great Polish liberal tradition. They are attacking their tradition because of political issues. And the Jews are a tool to do so. And the problem is that the Israeli government collaborates with the Polish government in all this. We at Yad Vashem came out, uh, to be exact, on the 5th of July, 2018, in a public statement for the first time in Yad Vashem's history, in which he attacked the agreement between the Polish and the Israeli government that accepted the narrative the distorted narrative, Polish narrative of the Holocaust. So it's a political issue. And the political issue is vast because now you have a fight over the past because the past is the present, because the Holocaust is not the past. The Holocaust is the present. 
you deal with Holocaust and the churches. That's one of the areas where Holocaust history is being researched. You know, churches, not only churches, religion, are different types of religion. There are extremist religious groups. There are liberal religious groups. There are people who collaborated with the Nazis. There are people who are opposed to the Nazis. That's part of the issue. And in Poland, and in Hungary, and in Slovenia, and in some other places, not only in the post-communist Eastern Europe, but also in the West. There it's not a question of a government, it's a question of political movement. It's not we, it's they. We are fine, we are okay. Distortion is a terrible danger. Distortion, in a way, is more dangerous than denial. It is more underhand. It is something that can be done without paying any price for it. It's something that one has to oppose wherever it appears. Why do they do it? Because they have a past which is not usable, because the past is complicated in Poland, in Hungary, and in other places, in Russia, and so on. And when you don't have a usable past, and you need a usable past to project your nationalism, we are better than anyone else, that's your nationalism. So you invent a usable past, a past that was in part. As I said, distortion is not total lie. It's not total denial. But you invent a usable past that is a combination of lies and invention. And that's a danger. That's a problem. What do you do about it? Well, you know, the only answer I have is what you're doing, education. You have to tell the truth, or as close to the truth as you can get. And the truth means that you have freedom of expression, freedom of research, freedom of publication. In Poland, they now accuse two major historians, the Professor Jan Grabowski, whom I already mentioned, Professor Barbara Engelking, who is working with the Polish Academy of Science, who tell us the truth. They are not the only ones. A large number of liberal historians, sociologists, anthropologists, and so on and so forth, who research the truth, who are the opponents of uh, the present regime, not politically necessarily, but socially, economically, culturally. And they are our friends. We have to defend, defend their freedom of research. There's a book coming out in English now, translation from Polish, which in the Polish original, and maybe some of you know Polish, is called Dalej jest noc, which means the night still continues. It's now being translated by other Shem into English. Read it when you get the chance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was an excellent lecture. Um, everyone in the chat, if you will, go ahead and start putting in your questions. And as those start to filter in, we will go through those. I do want to mention that I just put in the chat the information about our other two lectures that we're having today as part of the conference at 2 p.m. Dallas time. Um, we have the Michael and Elaine Jaffe lecture by Dr. Manaz Afridi, and she's going to discuss the Shoah through Muslim eyes. And at 5 p.m. Dallas time, we have the Mitchell L. and Miriam Lewis Barnett lecture with Peter Konstam, who is a survivor. And he is quite the, uh, the, the charmer. So y'all should join and, and see him because he's got quite the story to tell. If you, want, if you want me to respond, 
you have to wait until I get my hearing aids because I can't hear you properly. You know, at the age of 95, your hearing gets very weak. Yes, sir. I'm sure people are still typing in the chat. We don't have any questions just yet. While we wait for, for those questions to start coming in, Dr. Romer, did you wanna say anything? Oh, we do have a question now, wonderful. It is a, I have a question, is it a coincidence? Well, I'll wait for him to come back, I'm so sorry. Cindy, I can't actually hit the chat, it just it, it comes up, but it won't take, it won't return, I don't know why. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and Cindy, I put one in earlier, it's, it's before your comment, you might see it. Oh, I see it now, okay, perfect. Uh, we hit it the same exact time, so yours got buried right behind mine. Okay, now he's back. Professor Bauer, if you just let us know when you're ready. Okay. אני לא יכול לדבר, אני בזום. לא יכול לדבר עכשיו. מהמשטרה. רגע אחד, אני... מה? I okay, think I got, we have to give I Professor Bauer a moment. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I have to stop. Um, I have to stop. I have a, 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 a phone from the government. I cannot okay. carry on now. I'm sorry. You go ahead um, and take care of what you Hello. need. Um, David, Professor Patterson. There you are. Yes. Um, do you want to take over for a moment? Um, well, yes, <laughs> sure. Just shall, well, let's let's address uh, some of the questions, shall we? Okay. So I'll go ahead and I'll start reading those questions for you, Dr. Patterson. Okay. Can you comment on the rise of the American nationalism and Holocaust distortion, and how significant is it historically? Um. Yes, and the. I'm not. I'm not sure what American nationalism is, is exactly. Uh, it, it, certainly, the term for America doesn't mean what it means in Germany or France or Slovakia. But uh, there is there is a rise of Holocaust denial, Holocaust distortion. I think Holocaust denial runs along a spectrum. Uh, as Deborah Lipstadt. The, the, whom uh, Professor Bauer mentioned talks about this in her foundational work called Holocaust Denial. Um, and she describes it as the yes, but phenomenon. And it's a phenomenon saying, yes, well, the Jews may have uh, had some problems, but, and then you add on whatever suits your agenda. So uh, this is and it's not just in the United States, certainly is in the United States. Uh, Alvin Rosenfeld wrote a I think an important book called The End of the Holocaust about the trivialization, popularization, and relativization of the annihilation. Oh, Professor Bauer is back. Yeah, just a second. I'll start a video. Okay. Uh, if you want to ask me anything, do it very, very slowly please and uh, clearly so i can understand all right cindy then you're back again you if you don't mind paraphrasing those questions for professor bauer okay um one of the questions and i will rename you dr patterson um let me let me rename you in just a minute that is 
Professor Bauer. Professor Bauer, are you okay if we turn your video back on? I'm on the video. Okay, so let me find you. There's so many people on the call, it's very difficult for me to find one person. So if you'll give me just a moment so that I can put you back on the, on the spotlight and find you. In the meantime, um, is it a coincidence that Holocaust denial? Slowly, slowly, slowly. Yes, sir. Is it a coincidence that Holocaust denial has been on the rise on the right wing extremism around the world? You mentioned about this at the beginning, and so they would like to hear your ideas regarding around the globe. Well, um, uh, I am not sure that the denial is uh, now in America more prominent than it was before. It was there all the time. And if you look at uh, the internet archive, uh, you will see uh, many cases where this is uh, where you have uh, uh, Holocaust denial. I said that compared to the distortion issue, Holocaust denial is relatively uh, more easy to counter because it's simply uh, Holocaust denial says that the moon is made of white cheese uh, and uh, that Bill Clinton does not exist. The same invention. In other words, these are uh, sort of very basic things. Easier, no, no, not very easy, but easier to, to counter than uh, the distortion. Okay, and a follow up, another question is Can you comment slowly, on the. Slowly, slowly. Yes, sir. Can you comment on the rise of American nationalism and Holocaust distortion? How significant is it historically? Dr. Dr. Patterson talked on this a, a bit, but um, I, I've had someone ask if I, we can now have your perspective. Well, if I understood the question, uh, Holocaust is social in the United States. Uh, it takes different forms. It, it has, uh, for instance, the uh, uh, assumption that the Jews invent uh, more than is justified regarding uh, what happened during the Holocaust, and that they exaggerate the uh, uh, what happened to them, and that they use the Holocaust in order to advance political issues. So you you do have a distortion of the Holocaust in the United States as well. Uh, it is very difficult to uh, counter it because uh, again you you need education. You need to. Uh, have a uh, uh, educational system where you actually teach the Holocaust. And this exists, of course, in the United States, it's, uh, as you well know. Uh, the question is always whether there's enough of it or not. And there never is, because each time there's a new generation that you have to address, and the old generation forgets. And so you have a constant uh, struggle. And this is something that we are not going to uh, uh, be rid of uh, in the foreseeable future, uh, which raises a question whether the, uh, with, a, with a dying away of the survivors of the Holocaust, uh, the uh, Holocaust will be forgotten or not. The answer is no, it will not be forgotten because uh, there's a huge amount of uh, Testimonies, the Shah Foundation in uh, Los Angeles has some 53,000 uh, Holocaust testimonies. The, uh, 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 there are Holocaust testimonies in Seattle, in Miami, in Detroit, in many other places. You have a, uh, a very, uh, a very uh, huge number of testimonies outside of the United States that can be drawn upon. Uh, so, uh, no, uh, you have enough, uh, certainly enough uh, material to go on. So uh, the uh, fight against denial and distortion is, uh, can be done. Uh, and uh, in a way, you can say it is being done, uh, not enough, but yes, it is uh, being done and I think uh, that is a positive uh, thing. Uh, 
you have, of course, differences in different parts of the United States and different types of educational institutions and so on and so forth. But uh, if you look at it in an overall way, uh, yes, and the United States are members of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, which um, develops these things. So there's a uh, positive uh, development as well. And I think that uh, we should remember not only the negative things, but also the positive sides of it. Wonderful. I've got another question. Cindy, let me um, if we didn't just maybe jump in and ask um, one of the other questions that had come up. Um, the Catholic Church. That seems to be an interesting about, yeah. case um, insofar as they, would there be not an example of denial or distortion of sorts while the Holocaust was happening and then continues denial or distortion afterwards? What would you think about the Catholic Church? I think that the Catholic Church today is an ally. Uh, it's completely changed. I'm talking about the Vatican, not about uh, Catholics in different parts of the world that don't necessarily follow what the, uh, uh, what the Vatican says. Uh, this started with uh, Pope John the 23rd and uh, Franklin, uh, uh, was fully aware of this. He talked about it uh, quite a lot. Uh, you have a change in the attitude, of, especially of the Jesuits, peculiarly enough. Uh, if uh, 100 years ago, you would have said that the Jesuits are against anti-Semitism, you would have been sent to a, a, a lunatic asylum. Uh, in today, the Jesuits are allies in the fight against anti-Semitism. I mean, that's a fact. So uh, we need to realize the change, to look at it statically, to look only at the policies or lack of them of the uh, uh, Catholic Church during the war uh, and not see the development after that is, I think, a major mistake. We, um, we need, without uh, diminishing the guilt, I would say clearly guilt, of uh, uh, many Catholics during the war uh, regarding the, the extermination of the Jews uh, and the rescue by quite a large number of Catholics of other Jews. Now, uh, when you look at it uh, from a historical point of view, yes, there's Pope Pius XII, there are uh, the collaboration by uh, uh, Hungarian uh, uh, priests and so on, uh, and the opposition to the Germans by a small number of them. These are complicated things that have been researched in great detail. And yes, you do have the Catholic Church during the war as a very uh, um, uh, unpleasant uh, case, no doubt about that. But uh, uh, then there's a change. It's partly the result of certain individuals within the Catholic Church, basically, uh, 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 Roncalli, the uh, nuncius, the Catholic nuncius in Istanbul at the time, Angela Roncalli was a poor, a, 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 a a uh, Catholic peasant, a brilliant man who uh, changed very slowly and very carefully without getting in trouble with the conservatives, who changed the attitude of the Catholic Church together with a German uh, Catholic theo uh, theologian, uh, Bea was his name, B-E-A, who was a theologian at the Vatican who uh, demanded a change in the policy of the, uh, uh, of the Catholic Church. And this then came about when um, Angela Roncalli became Pope John XXIII and with the uh, Vatican Council of 1964, 65, uh, this became a change in the policies of the Vatican. So you have to realize the uh, development, not just a static uh, issue. 
Thank you. We have a comment from Professor Leibowitz that maybe you could respond to. One of the issues we are dealing with is a new generation, particularly younger Jews who claim Holocaust fatigue. Their avoidance of the topic reduces our ability to respond to claims of either deniers or the distorters. I didn't get that. Could you repeat that? The, the issue of Holocaust fatigue with the younger generation. Could you speak yeah. to that? The younger generation, but well, there's always an, <laughs> you know, younger generation is always a problem because <laughs> the younger generation changes, you know. <laughs> you have a, uh, a uh, each, each year you have a new younger generation. So you, you have a permanent issue there. It's not something that you can solve at one go. I think it should be clear to everyone. You need a permanent effort. You cannot let loose. You cannot say that we've solved the problem at any point. It's always a new problem. It's always a new generation. And you have to adjust yourself to it. Any kind of uh, educational or historical view that is static, that uh, creates a static picture, photograph of a situation is wrong. You need to see the dynamics, the development, and adjust your policies in accordance. Yes, sir. Can you widen your comments regarding denial and distortion to Europe as well, not just the US? Are, oh, are yeah. there any places similar to Poland? Yes, Hungary, Slovenia, and uh, there are also the, and Croatia, and uh, there are also uh, not governments or major political parties, but organizations and movements such as uh, the AFD in Germany the uh, 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 extreme right wing in uh, various other countries uh, that present the story of the Holocaust in a distorted way. So you have a, a large issue there. Now, one has always to remember that the whole issue of the Holocaust, its distortion and denial affects what I call the West, you know, <laughs> the geographic problem. But the, uh, I, the knowledge, the basic knowledge about the annihilation of the Jewish people in World War II is getting more and more uh, a, a public issue in areas that had no connection with the Holocaust whatsoever. You know, there are four Chinese universities, now apparently also a fifth, that teach the Holocaust. You have high schools in India that approach Yad Vashem for material to teach the Holocaust. You have situations in Africa, in Latin America and elsewhere of the same kind because the Holocaust is the most extreme case of something that's happening all the time, namely genocide. The most extreme form of genocide up till now, up till now, is the unprecedented, not unique, the unprecedented case of the Holocaust. Why not unique? Because if, uh, if it was unique, we can forget about it. And it happened only once. And it's not unique. It happened because people, humans, did it. And what humans did can be repeated by other humans, not exactly in the same way, but in similar ways. So the Holocaust was unprecedented, not unique. And that is something that is penetrated into the consciousness, not only of elites, intellectual elites, but of governments, of political movements, in different ways, sometimes in distorted ways. So there's plenty of work to do. Absolutely, thank you. I have a question from Marcy Littell for you. Do you consider January 27th, the International Holocaust Remembrance Day declared in recent years by the United Nations, a soft form of Holocaust denial, particularly because it has overshadowed the traditional American declared days of remembrance on the 27th of Nissan. Well, uh, uh, you know, uh, the United Nations as a result of uh, 
British and Israeli initiatives recognized uh, the Holocaust on the 27th of January. Uh, I was actually the second speaker at the United Nations on the 27th of uh, January 2006. And uh, uh, yeah, now uh, they recognize it, and this is important in its way, sure. Uh, but this is just one case, you know. The 27th of January has become a starting point for Holocaust education and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, that is important. You need sort of uh, uh, memorial days. You need some kind of uh, liturgy, uh, not necessarily religious liturgy, a general liturgy about some ma major events that you recognize as being major events. Now, why did the United Nations do that? It was unanimously accepted. The Iranians walked out. So it was unanimously accepted. Why? Because they realized that what happened to the Jews could happen to others in a different way. The extreme case of genocide teaches them about other genocides. That's the universal side of Holocaust remembrance. And I think that's important. Thank you very much. Let me just um, take one more look in the round, so to speak, um, across the screens and into the chat. If there are any um, additional questions? There is also uh, another link that has been posted by Edda um, about an initiative of Turkish Jews to fight Holocaust denial in, in Turkey. So you can follow that as well. Um, I'm just looking again at all our participants. They've come from far and wide. Um, this has been quite a gathering today, thanks to you, Professor Bauer. And we're really delighted that you joined us. Um, I think we're kind of at the top of the hour, a little after 12. We want to give everyone a rest for the next Zoom event uh, that begins in another two hours. So I think if you would all join me, please, and thank one more time our very distinguished speaker with applauding him in any shape or form. You can uh, unmute yourself now, clap your hands, sing out loud, um, do anything else that you want. And uh, again, thank you also all for being here. Thank you. For thank you, Dr. Power. Thank you so much, Yehuda. Thank you. Thank you. Be well. Thank, thank you, Doctor. Thank you, all the best. Tadaraba. Tadaraba. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Professor Bauer. Okay, all the best. Tadaraba. Oh, here, Ms. Masi, one more time. Yeah, it's me. <laughs> one more time, Tadaraba. Yep. We'll see you again in a little bit. No. Um, David? Send you want some con you want to do some concluding yeah. words? No, you uh, yeah, just, just a couple of words. And oh, oh, where's the camera? We we've had That's enough right. people unmute. I don't know that any concluding words will be heard. Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> Thank well, you. Well, we've been all thrilled to uh, have been able to do this. Um, what if about I may, before David says the last words, Yehuda, if you're still you if you're still on. I just want you to know how much it's appreciated and how important it was for all of us, scholars, older, younger, and the succeeding generation to hear your words and hear from you. Thank you. Indeed. Could not have said it better. Thank you, Marcy. Excellent. Um, and do we have a plan for introductions for our next speaker? Yeah, we do. I'll, I'll do the next one. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Thank you all. Yeah. Bye. See you at two. See you at two. For now. See you all at two. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.